In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed Virgin Mary, we place ourselves into your hands at the beginning of this Advent. We ask you to accompany us, to call upon your spouse, the Holy Spirit, to fill our hearts so that he can bring about the birth of Christ within our hearts, just as he brought about the incarnation of Christ in your virginal womb 2,000 years ago. Help us each in this retreat and through this retreat to live a holy advent, to prepare ourselves to understand the gift that God wants to give us in this Christmas season. Help us to be women who respond to your invitations with the same kind of yes that you, our Blessed Mother, did 2,000 years ago. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father and Son, Holy Spirit. This talk, you're not going to hear a whole lot about the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's kind of going to be more on the level of ideas, and then we'll wrap things up and kind of see how we can apply it. So don't freak out. The Blessed Mother will be in there. Okay. Um, you know, when I was in Yonkers, I used to, we have a parish that we run, St. Peter's, St. Dennis in Yonkers. It's in kind of a, if you know the neighborhood, it's on Riverdale, um, only less than a mile north of Mount St. Vincent's. It's kind of a poor neighborhood. It's essentially like a little extension of the Bronx. Um, it's, and it's a Hispanic parish. I'm going to guess it's over at least 90, to, if not 95% Hispanic. Um, and attached to our school there, or attached to our parish there, is the school, St. Peter's Grade School. And when I was stationed in Yonkers, I used to teach this class. I still don't know what the class was supposed to be called. It was basically anything at all that had to do with marriage, dating, relationships, theology, the body, family, all of that stuff. So I don't even know what the name of the course was supposed to be, but I just kind of went and taught. And when I was teaching these kids, um, when I was teaching these kids, you're dealing with kids that are wonderful kids, and I'm sure their parents, by and large, are wonderful people, but there are a lot of broken families. There's a lot of brokenness. And the parents tend to be immigrants, so they are here in this country, but they don't really fit in because they're first generation, and it's tough. They're not highly educated, by and large, and they're, you know, they're living in a pretty much a poor neighborhood. The kids have no problems about saying they're ghetto kids. They tell me that all the time. Father, we're in the hood, okay? So they have the complexes and the, the woundedness and the brokenness that come from that. A lot of times, you know, they don't have two parents necessarily, or if they do, maybe there's just a woundedness and brokenness in that marital and family situation. So when I was teaching there, you know, I would try to hit the kids from every different angle I could. One week I would come in and be all theological and intellectual, and the next week I would show them a movie and try to hit the emotions, and then the next week you try some different angle. And it was funny because you really end up teaching very few things, and you try to hit it from every different angle that you possibly can, and at the end of the year it's like they still didn't get it. It's like, oh. <laughs> so <clears throat> one of the things I discovered when I was teaching is that the people who make TV commercials are really geniuses. Probably you're going to roll your eyes at me and say, really, Father? It's because I really don't watch TV. It's true, I really don't watch much TV. Um, but the people who make TV commercials are geniuses. At least if you look at the best commercials that come out, the people that make those commercials really, really understand what makes us tick. And maybe you don't realize that until you want to do something like teach a class and you, you start Googling and saying, okay, find me good videos about whatever. And you find like the 10 best TV commercials of the year or the 10 best commercials about such and such a topic. And he's like, wow, these guys really nailed it. So 
I would, when I was teaching that class in the family, depending on what the theme was, a lot of times I would find, I would Google, you know, really good TV commercials about uh, whatever the theme was. One time I Googled um, on mothers, and I think it was Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. It's when the Olympics were in London. Pfizer had this incredible commercial about mothers. So you're following the stories of these five different moms of five different athletes from around the world. That's like a Brazilian volleyball player, an African kid who's in the track team, a Chinese girl who swims, an American a little blonde girl doing gymnastics, and I don't remember what the other one was. Um, but you're following the stories and you're watching them as little kids, and mom is waking them up out of bed. They don't want to get out of bed. Mom is kind of encouraging them and cooking them breakfast and driving them and taking them. And you're watching the kids grow up until finally they compete and the moms are there in the crowd. And of course, all five kids win their medals and the moms are just crying. And the, the unsung heroes of the videos really are the moms. And the fact, the idea is, is these women have spent their entire lives in the background supporting their children so that they can, their children can flourish. And their greatest joy is when their children win the award and their children are flourishing and the moms are all crying. But even more powerful than that one was a video that was on fathers. It was Dove Soap of all things. And it was a Father's Day video. So I was talking about fatherhood, that particular class, and I showed this video and I turned out the lights and showed, you know, it's only like a one minute or 90 second long video. And it's all these clips of dad moments. So you'll see little kids, they're like little kids uh, stuck in the toilet and runs out of toilet paper. And dad is like one or two, or maybe two years old and dad comes running in. And, you know, dad picking up the kids and throwing them in the air and catching them and all these dad moments. One of them was really cool was the dad obviously had one of those GoPro cameras on his head. So he's swinging the kid around. You're just looking at this kid's face and the kid's in heaven. He's ecstatic. And the background's all blurring because dad's swinging around helicopter style. So I turned on the lights again and all the girls, almost without exception in the class, were crying. Why was that? They didn't cry over their moms, by the way. And the reason they were crying is most of the girls didn't have that dad. They didn't have that experience. Um, some of them didn't have dad in the home at all. Maybe he ran off with some other woman. Maybe he just, life was hard and just disappeared. Um, some of them did have that dad, but he was, you know, fairly abusive or has alcohol problems or whatever, but they didn't experience what the people in the video were experiencing. And what the video showed them, it woke up in their hearts what their hearts were longing for. And what they're fundamentally longing for was the security that comes from knowing that they are loved by somebody who is strong. What the videos were showing is benevolent strength. That's why right, dads, you know, moms love in a different way, but they're not going to be picking the kid up and throwing them up practically to the moon and catching them. And in the, ch in the child's mind, dad in that moment is like Superman. So what happened is, in those childhood memories, we are learning that, and we, again, we learn the same thing about mom in a different way, but we are learning that there are people out there who I can trust. And the kids were longing for the security of heart that comes from trust. Now, those of you who, are, who go to our RC retreats regularly know that we are doing this year a series of retreats throughout the year. Um, and each month we're kind of nailing a, a different virtue. I'm using this book, I'm just going to make mention of it, this morning's retreat isn't really so much on, based on that. I'm using the book Broken Gods 
Hope Healing and the Seven Longings of the Human Heart by Gregory Popchak. If you want, you can come get a picture of it later if you're interested in it. A good book. That's as much of a commercial as I will give it now. But the gist of the book is this. We've all heard of the seven deadly sins, right? And we know that there are seven virtues that correspond to those sins. Each one of those seven deadly sins and each one of those seven virtues are simply ways that we either mistakenly or correctly pursue seven fundamental longings of our heart. The seven longings of the heart are abundance, dignity, justice, peace, well-being, and communion. You don't need to worry about writing it down. It's just to give you some context. But the seventh one, which I didn't mention, is trust. Okay, that's what I would like to focus on this morning and how the Blessed Virgin Mary is a model and a pathway for us to grow in that trust. When we talk about trust, I don't know if you're familiar with it. You remember Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People? In the 90s, that was kind of the cool book for like anybody involved in leadership conferences and stuff like that. His son, Sean Covey, took up where dad left off and wrote a book called The Speed of Trust. And they said, basically, trust comes from two things. When we see a person who has character and competence, we trust them. So character. Um, For example, if I'm going to hire a lawyer, I'm not going to hire the guy from Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, Saul Goodman. Why? Because he's a sleaze. He's this ambulance. If you don't know the series, he's an ambulance chasing lawyer. He's, he's a total con artist. He's smart. He's likable, all that. He's got all kinds. He's very gifted. But the guy is a total criminal. If I'm looking for a lawyer, unless I'm trying to cover up my criminal activities, I'm not interested in Saul Goodman. I'm interested in an upstanding, you know, professional type lawyer. Saul Goodman it has competence, but he has no character. It's all about him. He literally is the kind of guy who would sell his grandma if he thought he could make a buck out of it, okay? Now, on the other hand, if, you know, let's take the picture of my mom. May she rest in peace. But when my mom was still alive, let's pretend I had a delicate surgery involving my heart. <laughs> For all that my mom loves me, I'm not going to turn to her and say, I would like you to be the one to operate on my heart because I know you love me so much you'll absolutely do everything it takes. She has no competence in heart surgery. I'm not going to turn to her. So, for there to be trust, we need the confluence of character and competence. Now, is there anybody you can think of that has infinite good character, infinite love, and is infinitely powerful. Do any names ring a bell? Rhymes with Todd, starts with a G. (laughs) Okay. Our hearts are made for, we are made for the intimacy, for the peace of heart that comes from knowing, from trusting that I have a God who is a father to me, who is all-powerful, and who loves me infinitely. When we are grounded in that, we have a sense of trust, and with trust comes peace. When we are not grounded in that, and because of original sin, frankly, nobody in this chapel is 100% grounded in that, when we are not totally radically grounded in that trust, then there's at least a part of us that will say, I need to figure out things on my own. I need a backup plan just in case God isn't quite good enough. I don't necessarily trust that he's going to make me 100% happy. And why would we think that? Well, because of the cross. We see crosses, we see difficulties in our lives that God allows. And sometimes we say, I have to take matters in my own hand 
without understanding or accepting sometimes that God knows perfectly well the cross is there, but it's a gift that he allows you so that you can grow, so that you can become the best version of yourself, so that you can learn to depend absolutely on him. So when I talked about the seven fundamental longings of the human heart that correspond to the seven virtues and vices, the Longing for abundance corresponds to pride, which the false way of reaching abundance is through our pride, and therefore the proper path to it is through humility, exercising the virtue of humility. The longing for dignity corresponds to the vice of envy, and the corresponding virtue is of kindness. The longing for justice corresponds to the vice of anger or wrath or ire, depending on which particular translation you like. In Spanish, la ira, um, which corresponds to the virtue of patience. The longing for peace, you'll see there's overlap in a lot of these, corresponds to the vice of sloth, laziness, and the virtue corresponding to that is diligence. The longing for well-being, wellness, corresponds to the vice of gluttony, and the virtue that corresponds to that is temperance. And the longing for communion corresponds to the vice of lust, lujuria, and the virtue corresponding to it is chastity. In the case of the longing for, not trust, um, the longing for, I just lost the particular, I'm spacing out on here. Um, yeah, longing for trust. Um, that corresponds to the vice of greed also known as avarice, and the virtue of generosity, which we could also look at as charity. Charity in kind of a refined sense. So what happens is when we no longer live our lives with a sense of absolute total trust, that I am in the hands of a heavenly father who is all powerful and who loves me, and who is absolutely wise, and no matter what he, his providential plan in my life is, it is always for my greatest good. When we don't go through our lives living that way, then we're going to turn, like I said, to our own resources, which is where the virtue, or the vice rather, of greed comes in. We start, and greed doesn't mean that you have to be like Ebenezer Scrooge. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be mean. Or, Greed basically means I'm looking to control my circumstances. I'm going to control what I can control. And one of the two easiest things that I have control of, or at least I think I have control of, although in reality we don't even have control of that, it is my use of time and is, and is material possessions. Money and the things that money can buy. Those are the things that we tell ourselves that we can control. And God gives us a certain range of control in our lives, although frankly speaking, all you need is one solid earthquake or hurricane or misfortune, and whatever you thought you could control can go right down the drain. The same is true with your time. You think you can control your time, all you need is one nice traffic jam. <laughs> or bad health or something like that, and whatever control you thought you had of your time, right down the drain. So we try to control the things that we think we can control, and we get possessive or defensive of either our money or our possessions or our time. How many times, I mean, and I think the latter, especially in today's society, because there are so many messages and so many different stimuli that are bombarding us. This, I think, is the one that we're constantly getting hit with right now. How many of us in any given day feel ourselves getting frustrated when somebody we don't want to call us calls us? Uh, some people are laughing. <laughs> when somebody you don't want to, he's like, ah. Oh. 
they're going to take up half an hour of my time on this phone call. Maybe I'll let it go to voicemail. Or when somebody comes looking for you to help out in something, or when somebody says there's a retreat coming around the corner, or can you help clean up at the church, or do any of these things that get us out of our schedules. We tend to program ourselves, and there's nothing wrong with programming. There's nothing wrong with being prudent in your use of money. We need to. So we need to try to set aside reserves. We need to try to be intelligent and have savings and all those things. And we need to try to program our time so that we get the use it in the most productive way with an eye to productive being with an eye to getting to heaven. That's what we that's ultimately what our productivity should be about. But if something comes, if life throws us a curveball, do we freak out? That's the sign that I am possessive. Do I find myself feeling like I'm losing control? Do I find myself getting agitated, getting nervous, getting angry, getting defensive? When I see those things popping up, it means that I am trying to control my life because realistically, I don't have fundamental trust that I am in the hands of God. Emotions can come and go. Circumstances can come and go. I would dare to say that even Mary and Joseph experienced the emotions, the temptations at times to frustration or to annoyance or whatever, because those are human emotions. But do I let those things control me? Do I act according to them? Because if I do, it's a sign that I do not have radical trust in God. It means I'm trying, and it means that there's part of me that wants to try to be Lord of myself, and I'm not able to really abandon myself radically into God's hands and into God's will. And that's the difference between the saints and so many of us, at least in my case. Maybe, maybe all of you have already gotten there, and maybe I should just talk to myself, right? <laughs> So what is the antidote then? Well, St. Paul will tell us that the antidote is generosity. There's, I'm going to tell you, you know, the, there is only one expression in the Bible that we know for sure came from the lips of Jesus that do not appear in uh, the Gospels. Only one saying that we know for a fact that Jesus said that does not appear in the Gospels. It's in the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 20, verse 35, St. Paul, I don't remember who he's talking to or what the circumstances are, but he says something along the lines of, let us remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, which nowhere in the gospel appear. It is more blessed to give than to receive. There's more blessing in giving than in receiving. Jesus apparently said that, and it's only St. Paul tells us about it. You know, it's interesting because science, we always like to say science says, and usually when something begins with a statement, science says, tells us, usually it has nothing to do with science. It's usually there, somebody's about to say something that's completely outside the realms of what science can legitimately say, but anyway. There was a study in the University of Washington that essentially backed up what St. Paul said. They have done a study where on people, I don't know how they went about doing the study, but you know, measuring people, um, and there's a chemical measurement um, whereby when you go through life being selfish, that you fundamentally are less happy. But when people make acts of kindness, of generosity, giving of themselves or giving of their possessions, that there's actually a chemical release of dopamine, you know, the word dope comes from dopamine. There's actually a chemical release of dopamine in the blood every time we make an act of generosity to another person. You see a beggar on the street, you give him something, there's a little ding, part of you feels good. Where did that come from? Well, ultimately it's your conscience, but God made our bodies in a way that chemically there are reactions that will either positively or negatively affect us um, to guide us towards proper behavior. I have a doctor in the crowd out here, and I'm sure she can come and chop me down and tell me how wrong I am later on. But anyway, she's too nice to go, right? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but there's, that study actually indicates when we give, for example, to the poor, there's always a little chemical ding afterwards. Maybe in the moment it's uncomfortable, especially because they can tend to be uncomfortable people. You see somebody on the street, especially if you're a woman, maybe not feeling so safe. Guys, it's a little bit less of an issue. Um, there can be that discomfort, but when the fact, when the deed is done, there's a little reward. Now, giving money is good, but it's not the highest form of giving if you want. There's actually a guy um, who is, he's not a Raymond Christie man, he's in a different group that Raymond Christie started called Lumen. Uh, it's a businessman's group. Uh, Business people's group, because they're also women wives. There are a couple of you out here, I think. Um, and he works in the city. He goes down to Manhattan. And he has this thing where once or twice a month, he will just go and randomly, like he, I don't know where he works, but you know, he will walk to lunch. And he will randomly just approach some homeless person who's on the street and take them to lunch. He could very easily, you give him a brown bag with an apple and a peanut butter sandwich or something, and it would be an improvement. And it would be a good deed, and any one of us would be proud to have done that. But that's not what he does. He will come over to the person, crouch down, talk to them, get to know them by name. And of course, these people probably stink and all that. Invite them to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken with him ask what they want, sit down with them, have lunch, and for the next 20, 30 minutes, whatever, during his lunch break, engage in conversation while, you know, over a Kentucky Fried Chicken meal with this guy. And now he's actually expanded it, so he's, you know, he says, like, you know, he tells his friends, hey, I'm gonna be doing this on such and such a day, and his friends look forward to it, and they will arrange their schedules so that maybe three or four or five of them will do it, and they say, that is the most powerful thing I've done all year. I haven't even done that. I've never, I've never done that. To my shame. But this man will do that. He does it at least once a month, if not two, sometimes, probably maybe sometimes more, times a month as opportunities afford, or arise to get personally involved. And Frankly speaking, if you want to be selfish about it, when you get personally involved that way, God will personally reward you more and you will have more satisfaction, more fulfillment, and more happiness. And if you want to put it in chemical terms, you get a bigger dopamine, dopamine fix, <laughs> okay? So there's a scale of generosity. The lowest scale, I would say, I mean, there's probably all kinds of different categories in the scale. I came up with four. Okay, four different stages of generosity we can look at. The first is giving things, giving money, giving things, giving, giving the things you have. It costs a little bit of a sacrifice to yourself. Why do we not like to give money or things? Because secretly there's part of us that says, if I give it, am I gonna have enough? Or is this, if I give it, you know, because it's always going to hurt a little bit. Is that hurt going to make me unhappy? Or if I give it, maybe, am I going to be able to provide for my kids or whatever? There's always that question. The second, which also we just referred to, is giving time. It's not just the same to say, hey, here's five bucks, don't want to talk to you again, as it is to give time to interact the way that this man did with that homeless person, or to give time to the church, or to give time to that family member who is in need, or give time to the person who is annoying. If you all come over and talk to me after the retreat, I'll know what's up. <laughs> the third degree of generosity, I am going to title Poverty of Spirit. It's, it's, I have to explain myself once, be, uh, sometimes, because once I uh, was talking about the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, 
And to me, it was self-evident what Jesus meant. And then afterwards, somebody said, Lord, our Father, how can that possibly be a blessing? To be poor in spirit, doesn't that mean like you're spiritually poor, like you don't have God? I said, no, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> it's not poverty of God. Poverty of spirit means detachment of heart. I am voluntarily detaching myself from things that can be valid or licit or good because I don't want my heart to be attached so that it can be free to love God and love my neighbor more. When you enter a religious order, like myself and the Padres here did, we take three vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Father, you live in a house of high. Oh, fair enough, we live in a nice house. But poverty of heart means that you are not attached to things. Like when we make the vow of poverty, right now I live in Ryan, a beautiful house on a hill. You know, previously I lived in Yonkers. It wasn't so beautiful. Before that, I lived in the Philippines. Now we lived in a decent house, but I mean, it was a lot of times I was not hanging out in nice places. The idea being that I am not attached. Whatever God wants to do with me. And when we voluntarily start to live a simple if you want austere lifestyle, starting to give up little things voluntarily as gifts to God, then, I, then your heart begins to grow and open up. And again, if you want to know if you're attached to something, the simplest question is, okay, if something happens to it, what is your reaction? Well, I'm not <laughs> Look, I remember, um, do you guys remember the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh? <laughs> the Bhagwan in the 70s, I think, or the 80s. He was this total charlatan. He was worse than Saul Goodman. They took over this, he was one of these kind of Indian religious figures. And he had this cult leader, and he had all his followers. And they just went and took over some little small town in, in Oregon and voted him in to be mayor. And he had like 75 Rolls Royces and stuff, but he was so detached. So detached, it didn't matter to him if he had 75 or 80, because he was detached. Um, if you want to know if you're attached to something, how do you react if something happens to it? You got a nice car? Okay. Are you attached to it? Well, um, I don't know. What happens if some kid hits a baseball into it? What happens if you get T-boned? You know, even no injury or anything, but just your car gets... If you're attached to it, you're really going to freak out. It could be something your grandma left you, it could be, it could be anything. If we're attached to anything at all, at the end of the day, that is not God, then it becomes an obstacle. Your kids, actually, it sounds horrible, your kids, you can be attached in a bad way to your own children. Oh, how can that be? I mean, God gave me these kids. I'm supposed to, aren't you supposed to love your neighbor? Yeah, but some people love their children in a possessive way. Some people, you know, properly speaking, when we love our spouses or our children or anybody else for that matter, it's always we're loving in a certain sense God in them. When God is at the top of the pyramid, when he's in first place, then all of our other loves fall into order. Um, but some people, for example, um, do you lose your faith? No, if some tragedy were to strike your spouse or one of your children, would you lose your faith over it? Would you be angry at God? Of course it would hurt. You'd be deeply wounded because there's love. But would it affect your relationship with God? That's a good sign as to whether or not um, we have our, our, if we love our, our spouse or our children, in a, if you want a possessive way as opposed to a godly way. The fourth degree I'm going to refer to as the obedience of faith, to use a Pauline expression. The fourth degree of generosity is the obedience of faith. This is what we see lived by the Blessed Virgin Mary. We see all of these, frankly, lived by the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Gospels. And this is what we're going to touch on in the meditation, the prayer that will come later on. The obedience of faith de 
relies on, first of all, you have to be poor of spirit. A person who is poor of spirit is detached from everything else that is not God so that they have a heart that is capable of loving God 100%. (coughs) But then the person who lives the degree of generosity, of obedience of faith is actively seeking what is God's will. How can I go through a moment by moment aligning myself with the will of God? It's basically living in existence which is in function of God, which is what you and I were made for. And and frankly, this is what is going to lead us to greatest happiness. The reason we don't like to go there is, again, because part of us thinks if I really get radical about holiness, you know, you look at the saints and all these crosses and all these martyrs and all this the stuff, the persecutions and the, the austerity and the, all the difficult lifestyle of the saints. I don't want to do that. It's so difficult. I won't be happy. That's the temptation. And the reality is, yeah, there's going to be difficulty. There will be crosses. There may be persecution. There may even be martyrdom. But God only, God always wants your happiness. In all of those difficulties, if you look at the lives of saints, saints are happy people. They are joyful people. If you look at any pictures of John Paul II or Mother Teresa or Padre Pio, and you see the people that are with them, they're all, the people that are with them look always ecstatic, almost to the point where they look goofy sometimes. I remember this one family that I know in Pittsburgh where they got a private meeting with the Pope and there's like eight kids and there's mom and dad. The funny thing was this, you see John Paul II is coming down the line. So you see John Paul is greeting one child and then the next picture he's greeting the next child. So child number one is now crying and weeping and has this expression of just being undone. And the next one in line is really full of expectation and whoever the Pope is talking to, you see this really happy expression then he just moves down the line. Now you have two people that are crying and everything because they just met the Pope. And this one is full of joy and the next one's kind of nervous waiting for him. So by the time you got through all eight of the kids, they're all just all over the place weeping and everything with joy. I assure you, nobody acts that way when they talk to me. <laughs> so, I talked to Father Eric. It was so moving. I feel so full of joy that I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life. It's like I talked to Father Eric. I need a drink. <laughs> and I'm going to binge watch Netflix <laughs> nobody talked to me <laughs> but when we are men and women who live the obedience of faith when we give God his place he will fill us with joy 